I'm a morning person. Everything is better in the morning, especially sex. I've talked about this in an earlier episode, but walking is also better in the morning, especially if you are not having sex or not enough sex. I started walking every morning 36 years ago. Well, not every morning, just six days a week, and not very far, maybe three miles, eventually working up to four. But do the math. That's close to 300 days a year. Since I sometimes can't go out or the weather's bad or I'm traveling or hungover. Or, well, hardly ever hungover, just not feeling energetic. So 300 days times 3.5 miles times 36 years. That adds up to 37,800 miles, give or take. The circumference of the Earth at the equator is 24,901. So it works out that I have walked around the world one and a half times. Not bad, right? Walking is not sexy. It's not like skiing or skydiving or sailing. Walking is just putting one foot in front of the other over and over and over. But here's the important thing. Walking can sometimes lead to sexy encounters, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. I follow the exact same route every day through the neighborhoods where I live. I am on autopilot. I don't want to have to make any decisions. Should I cross here? Would the next street over be more interesting? I don't start out with anything in my mind. My steps are always the same but my mind roams free. Walking every morning was not my idea. 36 years ago, I had been through a trauma, a bilateral mastectomy. Translated, that's the removal of both boobs. I was not in the greatest shape emotionally. In fact, in a word, I felt like crap. About to turn 50, disfigured and alone. Who would want such a woman? I go to a therapist and ask him to make me feel better. Walk, says the therapist, as far as you can in 20 minutes every day. I follow his advice. Initially, it's a chore, an effort to get out the front door. There's no sex in my life at this time, so <laughs> might as well walk. The river that flows through Albuquerque. It's a 10-minute walk to the Bosque, 20-round trip. Every morning for two weeks, I do the prescribed 20 minutes to the bosque and back. I return to the therapist's office. I'm still miserable. The therapist writes a new prescription. 30 minutes. Eventually, I'm walking an hour each morning. A race walker zips past me, arms pumping, moving so fast it's like I'm standing still. That walk has become part of my daily routine. I'm no longer miserable but I'm still alone. A cosmetic surgeon installs gel-filled implants where the boobs used to be. Those implants wouldn't fool even a blind man. They are somewhat uneven. One implant is a little higher than the other. But they do fill out a t-shirt, and I keep walking. I meet Tony, a man who doesn't care if I have actual human flesh or silicon on my chest, and we marry. As it happens, Tony is not a morning person. He has no interest in joining me on my walks, or he might if I'd wait until at least 10 o'clock. But I don't need company, not on my walks. And by the time I get back, Tony is awake, and life is good. I hadn't figured on leaving New Mexico, but Tony has offered a teaching position in Texas. We buy a house a dozen blocks from the courthouse square. I keep walking, out the front door, past houses, small businesses, around the square with the monument of the Confederate soldier and a drinking fountain once labeled white only, past a hardware store that's been there forever, a couple of restaurants, north to the best barbecue in town, and south to home. Tony's teenage daughter comes to live with us, bringing an ill-mannered black lab, Moki. Moki chews the flowers I've planted right down to the ground. 
we take him to obedience class. Makes no impression on him. It's suggested that he might be better behaved if he got regular exercise. Walks, for instance. Hey, they're my walks, not the dogs. I do this walk alone. I trip over a hose in the backyard and fall flat on my face, knocking out my front teeth. I would like to blame this on Moki, but it really is not the dog's fault that I am clumsy. It takes almost a year and many visits to a dentist in Dallas to get dental implants to replace the missing teeth. I get a call from the friend of a friend who has heard that I have implants and she wants my advice. Are you happy with them, she asks. Oh, pretty happy, I assure her, but the left one is a little higher than the other. There's a hesitation, and then she asks, but can you chew? She was inquiring about my teeth, but I was thinking about my tits. Sometimes it's easy to get confused when you're having parts replaced. After a five-year Texas exile, we were back in Albuquerque, minus the teenager, who has taken the dog and gone to live with her boyfriend in Boise, Idaho. We buy a charming Victorian cottage in an old neighborhood. By now, I can't imagine not going for an early morning walk. Out the front door, turn right, past the elementary school and down the hill, around the old hospital, across Central, up the hill past the press club. A homeless man in a Santa Claus cap with a dog on a leash and his belongings in a shopping cart hangs out near the press club. He likes to talk and I like to listen. His big dream, the man confides to me one morning, is to fuck a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. I wish him well. My eldest son and his family are planning to spend a year in Spain. They found renters for their house in upstate New York, but the renters are unwilling to take their dog, Jake, a lab husky mix. And I make a serious error. I tell my son, if you can't find anyone to take care of Jake, send him out to me. A month later, Jake arrives by plane in a crate. Jake is an ill-mannered lout, a lot like Moki. Not that Jake's a bad dog, actually he's very affable, but in my opinion, all dogs, no matter how affable, are pains in the ass, and Jake is simply another example. But I cave, and Jake accompanies me on my morning walks. At the end of the year, my son and his family return from Spain, and we put Jake in the crate, drive him to the airport, check him in at the freight office. Thank God that dog is going home. Jake peers out of his crate at me. He looks so doleful. I weep quietly on the way home. Damn dog. I resume my morning walks. Solo. We got tired of living in a charming Victorian cottage. The roof leaks, the swamp cooler needs replacing, the cellar door is rotting, the fence needs painting. There's too much yard to take care of. We sell the house. I take my last walk through the old neighborhood. We move into a loft apartment in downtown Albuquerque. People from the Northeast Heights are afraid to come downtown. It's dangerous, they say. Drunks on the weekends, druggies, shootings, muggings, violence. Aren't you afraid? People ask. No, at 6 a.m. is peaceful. Just me and the homeless and a few crazies. Out the front door, turn left. On a bench outside our building, a homeless man is washing his hair with bottled water. His name is James. Good grooming is important. James tells me. His belongings are neatly folded. His housekeeping on that bench is impeccable. Head west, past coffee shops and breweries, restaurants, Charter High School, the Federal Building. Sometimes I pass as the security guards. Marco and Marcus and Ray are raising the flag, and I've been known to occasionally play the Star Spangled Banner on the kazoo. After a few blocks, a neighborhood of modest houses, flowers in the front yard, morning paper in the driveway. 
Feral cats wait for handouts from the local cat lady. Turn right toward the country club, past grand houses with manicured lawns and old cottonwoods. The seasons pass. Hawks with young in the nest, dive bomb walkers. Geese and cranes fly overhead in wavering Vs, honking. A pair of mallards waddles across a lawn. Coyotes skulks along, eye out for an unobservant cat. A woman waves, tells me to help myself to arugula, spinach, chives in her yard. After an hour or so, I'm home again, and Tony is waking up. Then Tony falls ill with an incurable disease, and for the next three years, I keep walking, 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 and I know that if I don't walk, I will lose my mind. A skunk parades by, waving its tail. A rabbit freezes in place, pretending I can't see him. A raccoon bolts down into a drain to the river. A roadrunner runs across the road, leaps onto a porch railing. Other people are out walking, too, and we recognize each other and wave, say hello. Every morning I see him, a tall, thin, gray-haired man with a cane. His name is Richard. Richard is married to his fourth wife, he tells me. I tell him about my husband, who recently died. You'd better get a dildo, Richard advises. All the men you meet are going to be married, gay, neurotic, and sometimes all three. Another regular is David. He walks two yappy little dogs. Our conversations become a daily event, and I find myself looking forward to them. I learn that he's divorced, but on good terms with his ex-wife, and one day we arrange to meet for lunch. David and I read the same books, enjoy the same movies. He likes to cook. He strikes me as very attractive. David's brother is coming to visit, and I invite them both to my place for dinner. It's a fine evening, but I do wonder if I can give the brother a few dollars and send him across the street to the movies. I really like David. Maybe something is going to happen here. A couple of weeks later, David invites me to his place for dinner. Oh, this is exciting. I have an actual date at his house. Now, just between us, I put a toothbrush in my purse in case I'm invited to stay over. The dogs greet me with enthusiasm. There's a nice house, good art on the walls, leather-covered sofa. I sit at the counter on a bar stool while David prepares dinner. He mixes martinis. I have never had a martini in my life. And while he cooks, I sip my martini and nibble aged cheese, and we talk. Like another martini, David asks. <laughs> sure. We move to the dining table. He serves bourguignon, rice, asparagus with hollandaise, salad. He opens a bottle of Pinot Noir, and we talk and eat and drink. It's a terrific meal. I have another glass of wine. I am getting completely sloshed. Dessert appears. I don't remember what it was, but it was probably terrific, too, like the rest of the meal. We finish the bottle. The last of my inhibitions, which weren't great in the first place, have completely vanished. I lean across the table. You know, I must have a crush on you, I tell him. David looks at me oddly. Well, I'm flattered, Carolyn, but I'm gay. I remember Richard's advice on getting a dildo. All the men I'm likely to meet are married, gay, or neurotic, Richard said, and sometimes all three. I don't know if David is neurotic, but Richard was right about the other two. Every morning that spring and summer, dressed in my usual baggy pants, ratty shirt, baseball cap, I pass a coffee shop where a good-looking silver-haired man sits at an outside table, drinking a latte and reading a book. He's always dressed in an elegantly tailored suit, coordinated shirt, tie, pocket square, and socks, 
coordinated socks. This is an unusual sight in downtown Albuquerque, especially at 8 o'clock in the morning. Silver Hair sips his coffee, reads his book, and ignores me as I walk by. I am determined to catch his eye. I slow down as I pass, thinking he might look up and notice me and say, hello. He does not. No luck the next day or the day after or the day after that. Weeks pass. As it happens, a neighbor at the other end of my hall owns an impressive collection of fancy socks, and he offers to loan me as many pairs as I want. I take him up on his offer, and a few days later, wearing the pink ones with yellow stripes, I pause in front of silver hair and give him a little ankle to show off the socks. No reaction. The next day, orange socks with wee purple hearts. Nada. Then the pair I've saved for last, black with glittery gold spangles. Finally, silver hair looks up and smiles, nice teeth, and says at last, good morning, would you care to join me? And so I do, and we talk, but alas, our politics and just about everything else we talk about are at opposite ends of the spectrum. I return my neighbor's socks, silver hair goes back to his book, I wave and he waves back, and I keep on walking. The pandemic comes, and life changes. Everything is shut down, including many of the things I love. Going to movies and plays, meeting for coffee, having dinner in a restaurant, you know, all the stuff everybody misses. Performances of my solo show are canceled. I miss the people I used to see regularly. But there are others. The three security guards at the federal building watch for me every morning and worry when I'm running late. The woman who cleans the U.S. courthouse comes out to say hello. The man who lives where that roadrunner hangs out honks when he drives by in his red pickup. I have only about 12,000 miles to go to finish my second circumambulation of the globe, so I intend to keep on walking, even now that I've met a guy who shares most of my interests and is really hot and wakes up almost as early as I do. Because everything, everything really is better in the morning. You can watch the video on YouTube, read this and other stories on my blog at funnycarolyn.com and leave me a message. Tell me what you thought of this one and come back next week for episode number 32, Directions for Aging Disgracefully. I'm Carolyn Meyer, and I'm aging disgracefully.